Okay, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing after campus dance? How many people made it there? You know, I went last night, because I always like to go for a little bit. I said, we're just going to go for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and I got home at midnight. Uh, you just run into so many people. Next thing I knew, I was like talking to her, and I was like, oh my god, I got to get up early tomorrow. But it is so great to be with all of you this morning. If you don't know who I am, my name is Mukesh Jain. I'm the Senior Vice President for Health Affairs and Dean of uh, Medicine and Biological Sciences at Brown. It is so great to be with you for this most distinguished event, for Ruth B. Sauber, who, through her substantial contributions as a Medical Student Affairs Officer for more than 20 years, 1972 to 94, had a profound and enduring impact on the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University and its students. And we heard, we, we hear so much about Ruth Sauber from so many alums. We heard about her last night, and, uh, and it's really great to celebrate this annually. This lectureship was established in 1994 by her son, Richard A. Sauber. Dick is here in the audience, Dick. Yep, sorry, I didn't, I know you don't wanna be. <laughs> I'm going to take a detour and just uh, tell you that I am so happy to see Dick here. He, is a, he has a really easy job, um, and I'm so glad that he could leave his easy job and come and join us. He just happens to be the special, he's an attorney and special counsel to President Biden. So he's got his hands full. Uh, but the most interesting thing about Dick and Pam is that they have a young lady, Elise Sauber, who's finishing up her, her first year of medical school. And that is really, really, really great. So Dick, alongside with friends and family, really established this lectureship to pay tribute to Ruth Sauber's service, legacy, and impact with a, with a, a goal of fostering lasting relationships between faculty, alums, and students in the medical school. So each year, a distinguished Sauber lecturer is nominated by their peers in the Brown Medical Alumni Association. And I think that's really important, elected by your peers, which is really quite a statement on all our speakers. And then they're chosen by the board of directors to receive this honor. The individual selected is supposed to embody the philosophy of Brown Medical Education Program, someone who views medicine as a socially responsible human service profession. That can certainly be said for our 2023 Sauber lecturer, Dr. Peter Chin Hong. Dr. Chin Hong is a national thought leader specializing in treating infectious disease in immunosuppressed patients. He has been one of the leaders of institutional community education around COVID-19 and monkeypox and through the pandemic, his expertise and advocacy shone light on how we could respond to COVID disparities through news outlets, radio, television, where he shared his expertise through writing, speaking engagements, and interviews. Today, he'll talk to you about his journey as both a physician and an activist in his presentation entitled, Physician as Activist. Without further delay, Peter. Thanks so much, Dr. Jane. I asked to be given this handheld mic because I think it's a lot of fun to have a handheld mic. I always wanted to as a child and go around the audience and be like Oprah Winfrey. Uh, so I hope you can uh, regale me with my, uh, with my mic. And I think there will be parts in this uh, talk that I'll give uh, that will be part personal journey and then uh, part uh, how we can all be activists, I think no matter where we come from. And I think one thing I learned from my friend and colleague, Ashish Jha, uh, is that uh, I think what the COVID pandemic showed us is that we don't have to stay in our lane. We don't have to be the world's expert in antibodies to talk about vaccines. And I think we all can be activists and, and speak to the community because of all the misinformation and uh, disinformation around. What I'm gonna do uh, today is really 
talk in the first part about how I got here and then uh, over the last three years, how all these experiences from growing up uh, in the Caribbean, from being at Brown, uh, shaped me and gave me those tools to do what I did for the last three years. When I first came to Brown, uh, I learned about a, this concept called liberal medical, liberal education, first of all. I think growing up in a British system that uh, Trinidad was in education, uh, people just went straight to medical school from high school and we didn't really understand what liberal uh, education was. And when I came to Brown, they said that, uh, or they taught me that a liberal education is giving you keys to open doors not yet opened. And I didn't really know what that m meant. And, you know, and certainly the, I was in the program of liberal medical education. And what it really taught me and on reflection is that, uh, you know, I really got all of these tools, all of these keys that allowed me to do what I did over the last three years. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, this is uh, where I grew up. This is Trinidad. Uh, and this is the view from, you know, from my car driving. And it's as far away from Providence or San Francisco as you can imagine. Um, this is where Trinidad is. It's the southernmost uh, island in the Caribbean chain archipelago from Florida down to Venezuela. And it's only about eight miles from Venezuela um, uh, at its nearest point. Uh, so, well, it depends on the mood of the audience, but I'm just gonna play some music of David Rudder, who is one of you know my favorite uh, classical uh, Trinidad Soka music, to just set the mood to give you that feeling of how it was uh, growing up. <laughs> And if everybody, anybody feels the spirit, you can like just get up and move, you know? <laughs> so, <clears throat> these were the sounds of my childhood uh, growing up. So I grew up in a, in a village. I, I came from the bush, as they say in Trinidad. Uh, you know, a rural part in a, in a country that was a developing country. So the, the back of, of, you know, of, of anything. And uh, people, when I went to high school in the second largest city in, Tr in Trinidad called San Fernando, people would say, wow, you come from the bush, boy, or you from the country. And literally, they were in the country themselves. So it was like a... <laughs> I didn't know who was more country than who, but this was my, uh, you know, the shop that I grew up in. Uh, my, my, uh, my parents, my dad was uh, Trinidad born from Scottish, Chinese, and Indian ancestry, and he was sent to China when he was three to um, carry on the culture. There was no internet, there was no language lessons in Trinidad, so the best thing you can do as a family to preserve the culture is to send your first child to the motherland, and then hopefully meet somebody and, and bring them back. So we met my mom there, brought them back, and I grew up in the shop. Uh, and those were my first lessons. Uh, my parents were like essentially social workers of the village. Uh, when people couldn't pay, they would give them uh, groceries. We delivered groceries for free. I was part of that uh, uh, every day. Uh, and although I was very angry at uh, working in the shop all the time, uh, because all my friends were playing, uh, you know, games or football or soccer and, and, and going out to discos and things like that. I had to, like, work in the shop. But it really taught me all these, these lessons. You know, my dad was essentially, like, the mayor of, of the village. Um, you know, during um, uh, carnival times, he would have a little carnival rally. Uh, for, he had Easter eggs for the kids in the village uh, and, and taught people to write, uh, would take people in and mentor them uh, as workers in the shop. And then I came to Brown, um, you know, <laughs> so I was like listening to this Car Caribbean calypso, soca music, you know, working in the shop, being mad because I only had one set of clothes instead of when I looked at TV, everybody had, you know, there were all the four seasons and you change your clothes all the time. So I was really excited, you know, my, my first winter in Providence, I made a lot of snow angels and um, it was fun, but by the second winter it got really old. And um, I really had to escape, but, but Brown really taught me a lot. Uh, you know, I think just seeing some friends in the audience uh, here, including uh, John Ng Wong and Priscilla, that were really key uh, mentors to me. 
uh, Dream Brown, uh, like the family, like Ruth Sabo was uh, in, in medical school to many of us. And I think um, some of these experiences at Brown uh, really shaped me. One was, of course, was working with Steve McGarvey uh, during undergrad after I took uh, a class, Burden of Disease in Developing Countries, and was just mesmerized by the interplay of anthropology, sociology, uh, in and cardiovascular disease outcomes. And so I, I you know, he, I was kind of a hapless sophomore, and I inserted myself into the research team early on, and I went back every year until I was able to get paid for um, my work. And it was just a really fantastic experience. And what I learned from that was that, you know, we had to, to do science, you had to work with the political leaders, the village chiefs, and the health uh, minister, and, and all of these things. So I think it, it taught me that, uh, you know, how to work with, with diverse, people with diverse opinions, and people who are suspicious of you. So all of these came uh, to pass um, during the pandemic. So this is Samoa, which is kind of, uh, you know, one, if you draw a line from New Zealand to Hawaii, it's about one third uh, that line. And it was much in contrast to how I was growing up because uh, in Trinidad and the Caribbean, uh, it was, it's a country of different uh, cultures. Uh, nobody, the indigenous people of the Caribbean were wiped out by a lot of infectious diseases. When you go to, and there were immigrants from India, from China, uh, from Africa, people were really trying to grasp onto their culture and, um, and but that culture had been changed and, and bastardized as, as some people would say because so much time and distance had passed from the original uh, country. In Polynesia, when I went, people were from there. They had a good sense of where they were. So that contrast was really, really uh, important to me. Uh, you know, in, in terms of a uh, medical culture. And I put this, this picture up because um, this is kintsugi, uh, sugi, sugi, which is a Japanese art form of uh, broken pottery that you lovingly glue back together with gold uh, glue and gold paint. And it's really meant to celebrate the imperfections that we have. And it comes back to that theme of you don't have to be perfect to be an activist. You don't have to be perfect to be uh, talking about science uh, to the public uh, since there's so much, again, uh, misinformation out there. So when Derek Walcott from the Caribbean got his Nobel Prize in, in Stockholm uh, several years ago, he, he talked about uh, the Caribbean culture as one where, uh, you know, you, you, the, you leave your motherland, you come to the Caribbean as an immigrant and the vase gets broken and your culture gets broken, uh, but you reassemble the culture with love. You, you reassemble it with so much love that when you put back the vase together, even though it's imperfect, uh, it, it, it's so lovingly embraced. And I think all of those themes uh, really resonate uh, with me uh, as I went on that journey. So then I moved from Rhode Island to San Francisco. Actually, the way I got there was um, my best friend from high school uh, from Trinidad uh, was when I was at Brown, he was at MIT, and he moved to San Francisco to work for Oracle, and I remember during Brown, kind of one of those trips to the South Pacific, I, I stopped off in San Francisco to see him, and I, 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 he lived in the mission. It was a free hipster mission, and I ate a burrito every day, and I was like, wow, I have to move to San Francisco. It feels like home food, because it's kind of like an Indian roti with, you know, a little akati roll, which is very common in Trinidad, and at that time, you couldn't really get much in the way of those kinds of foods. So I, it, it was really a place that drew me. And of course, what else drew me was uh, their multidisciplinary work in HIV and AIDS. Um, you know, I had a friend whose dad uh, passed away from HIV. So early on, I think I sought out those experiences at Brown, worked with uh, Tim Flanagan, Jody Rich, uh, um, Chuck Carpenter. Uh, he was still there when I was training. So really huge influences on me that allowed me to really be excited about moving to San Francisco because again, HIV was one of these areas and the reason why I was interested is because uh, it wasn't just uh, monolithic. There were people of all specialties that came around the table. Uh, multidisciplinary was the first example of uh, interdisciplinary work um, to solve a common problem. So at, at UCSF, uh, I, I did residency uh, in internal medicine and uh, just continued to fall in love with infectious disease. 
And uh, over time, I, I got more interested in, uh, apart from doing some clinical research in medical education, and particularly in building pipeline programs, because growing up in Trinidad, you know, my dad always, uh, you know, would support kids to go to s the next level of school. Uh, and really, I saw b before my eyes the way in which he transformed people's lives by being very deliberate in, and mentor uh, and being a mentor uh, in their journey. So at UCSF, once I became faculty member there, um, I got very much involved in pipeline programs uh, and bringing diverse pipeline programs together uh, to really uh, have a diverse population in, in medicine through not only in clinical care, but in research as well to, to who are best suited to answer the questions in the communities from which they arise. Um, and this, this program is another example, which is called SF Build, where we were building the next generation of, of, of scientists. Um, so it was a partnership between UCSF and one of the uh, San Francisco State University. And it was, what it taught me was that you can't just focus on the students, you have to focus on the uh, faculty. So there had to be faculty collaboration with grants being written by, by faculty from both schools and institution. So the leaders of both institutions have to really trust and respect each other. So where does that take me? So um, right now, so literally as the pandemic started, um, because of these experiences in medical education, I was lucky to be um, given the job of a new title, which is Associate Dean for Regional Campuses at UCSF School of Medicine. And what it's doing and what problem it's trying to solve is really um, trying to build a workforce in the Central Valley. Central Valley is uh, a very misunderstood part of California. The health outcomes are similar to Appalachia or the US-Mexico border. It has the worst disparities in the state. Um, it's an aging physician population. Uh, there's a lot of movement from the coastal cities to the Central Valley because it's cheaper. So the population is increasing, you have fewer healthcare providers, uh, and uh, a very diverse workforce with a lot of f migrant farm workers. So the task I was given was to really build the physician workforce with this uh, job title by uh, having a, a regional campuses there. So we already had a relationship with UCSF Fresno uh, in the Central Valley for several years, particularly in GME, graduate medical education, and then most recently in undergraduate medical education. And um, what we were going to do, which was very exciting, was uh, to develop a PLME-like program, given my experience, at the newest University of California campus at Merced. So right this year, we've accepted the first 15 students in a proof of concept uh, program from high school who will spend four years at uh, UC Merced doing their undergrad, being enriched just like I was in the PLME, uh, and then being taught by UCSF School of Medicine faculty, but not in San Francisco, in, Merce, in the Central Valley, because the idea is the more you delight and have people in the region, the more they're likely to stay there to practice. So eventually we hope to increase this class size to about 50, and maybe after I retire, they will have their own independent medical school, just like UC Riverside did uh, lower down in, in near to Los Angeles. So that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm also um, working with, you know, I'm uh, overseeing uh, the UCSF program at Berkeley, and that's called the Joint Medical Program, where uh, it's the School of Public Health at Berkeley, uh, where the students stay there five years and, and one. But my main job, essentially, you know, part of it is medical education, which is the easy part, which is to, to make the, transform the curriculum at UCSF to the Central Valley. Uh, because it's the same accreditation, but the hard part is really the politics. So I always tell people that most of my time is spent just making friends with people and, um, you know, maybe playing the same kind of music I'm playing for you and, like, uh, really having uh, a good time because I think they are very mistrustful of, uh, of academia and, you know, traditional academia like UCSF. They've called us colonists. Uh, they are wor worried about, you know, our, our true intentions in the valley, and um, you know that is a, a, a big barrier that we have: the differences in culture, the mistrust um, of even in academia here compared to academia uh, on the coast. So these are all things that that I'm working through. 
there have been a lot of frustrations, uh, but there have been a lot of successes too, and, and I have a great team. So COVID hit, I got this new job, and then COVID hit, and uh, every, everything stopped in its tracks. And I remember uh, feeling that we were so distant from our patients, everyone was wearing masks. So I think a few of us started carrying our pictures to show patients, to humanize the experience a little bit more. Uh, on the wards, and um, you know, that became my 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 journey. Um, given all that preparation that I have, so you know, I I became a sort of activist unknowingly. It wasn't something that I planned on. I didn't do courses in activism at Brown and and studied the books. Uh, it was something that just fell into my lap. And um, this next video I'm going to show is uh, a video that I sh had the. Uh, newscaster who's prepared for uh, Asian American medical students for their national conference, but it really speaks, I think, to the point of why we should be activists in, in healthcare. Oops. I'm Robert Honda with NBC Bay Area News and the host of a talk show, Asian Pacific America, and I am honored to send this message of welcome to the Asian Pacific American Medical Student Association, not only as a journalist, but who knows, maybe also as a future patient. Now, first of all, I wanna congratulate all of you on your personal accomplishments. Just to get to this point, took a lot of talent, dedication, and perseverance. Now, I can't dispense medical advice, but I do know the best way to get the right information to the public is to go to the right experts. And that's why I very much appreciate Dr. Peter Chin Hong and others like him for their expertise, but also for stepping up and speaking out to the community and on behalf of the community. It is painful to say that this is a community that can be overlooked. It's happened, it is still happening. And it is up to us as individuals and collectively to try to keep that from happening. So I hope you can keep that in mind as you go forth in your careers. It is very important that the general public see us, hear us, and most importantly, listen to us. I hope you have a very successful gathering I hope you learn a lot and that you have a lot of fun doing it. And now to whoever is hosting this event, back to you. They always say that on TV. So how do you, do, how do you become an activist in healthcare? Um, what are we doing for the next pandemic? So I came up with a mnemonic. I always make mnemonics for my medical students. Uh, it's kind of probably because I love studying for, from first aid for the boards. So I came up for, with the with the six S's, and I'll go through each of these uh, and use examples from the last three years. I think at the, at the core of everything is, is using science. Um, I think the public, you come from a place of credibility already, and when you use science at the beginning, it, it, it has a lot of benefits, so I'll start with that. Um, the, the whole reason why I was given this pulpit is because, again, what was happening in in uh, Washington DC at the time was that uh, the CDC wasn't giving uh, reliable information or the information that were given under the previous administration was just really, didn't make a lot of sense to clinicians. So we started uh, taking to Twitter and social media to really share information on how to take care of patients, how to get remdesivir uh, at, for a patient. At that time, you had to fill out three sets of paperwork. One, your local institutional review board or ethics board the FDA to get a, uh, you know, an IND and to the manufacturer of the drug. So we kind of put together a how to do list. It took three days in those days. So I think, or, uh, you know, I'd be called to talk about, you know, how do you get COVID? So I think that's how it started for me. I think it was the science and using, and, and being able to explain the science. And that came from, you know, my love of teaching medical students. And I, lo I love seeing those light bulbs uh, go up. So. Once I had the science uh, down uh, and people started to trust me, uh, I was able to speak up. So, you know, maybe I might start talking about uh, biology, but then I'll end up with uh, something about social issues. But one of, the, one of the most important things, apart from using science, is speaking up when you have to. Uh, you know, I was telling uh, Dr. Jane that one of the groups that I worked with very closely during the pandemic was the Association of Black Cardiologists. They were the first group to really highlight the disparities even before the New York Times in COVID as it was happening. So on the first webinar that we gave, which was one of the first webinars on disparities in COVID in the country, uh, I was with them uh, doing it and we were Zoom bombed. It was the first, you know, one 
cases of Zoom bombing. It was before Zoom security. And all these people came and they were really trying to intimidate uh, the speakers, the audience. Uh, and what really happened was something really beautiful. And I'll encourage you to think about this the next time you're in a situation like this. So these people are sending a lot of obscenities uh, to the general audience uh, while the speakers were talking about uh, COVID and how it impacted people of color. And what the audience did was incredible. There were a thousand, more than a thousand people all over the country. They just started putting in the chat affirmations of love. We love you. This is amazing. We appreciate you so much. And that really overwhelmed all the haters. Um, and, and, and that was a really a great example. At the end of the webinar, um, you know, Michelle Albert, who is a friend and colleague of mine at UCSF, who's now this, the president of the American Heart Association, for healing, she was like in the background texting us furiously, you know, what should we do? Should we sh close down the, or we were asking her actually, should we shut down the conference? Can we go on? Uh, she said, no, we must go on. Uh, and then the audience stepped in and at the end she read a poem by Maya Angelou to really heal all of us. So I think that was really uh, a great example of how speaking out, you know, speaking up bo both from talking about the pandemic and its impact on people of color, but speaking up from the audience perspective can really have an impact on hate. Um, speaking up was really also something that I ended up having to do during the pandemic too in terms of the use of tear gas. So I think the way I did this was again starting with biology. I think people had tried to, you know, uh, not, uh, oh, not promote tear gas use or to try and ban it in the United States even though it's banned internationally for warfare and during COVID during the George Floyd protests, we're using a lot of tear gas. So the way we approached this was not saying, don't use tear gas, it's so unethical, you're not using it internationally, because those uh, techniques hadn't been used. But what we thought, or what I thought was, hey, you know, maybe I can talk about how tear gas can both increase susceptibility to COVID in people who didn't have it because it makes your airways irritated. And you can also get COVID, uh, get, transmit COVID more easily because it makes you cough. Um, so I think that really got some traction. Um, it, it was kind of picked up by a lot of people. And in some jurisdictions like Portland and in the Bay Area, they actually banned tear gas, even though federally they didn't. So, um, you know, they still continue to use tear gas. But it was a way in which I think using science at the core can really allow you to speak up. Um, I think it's important to socialize and not do things by yourself. Uh, again, what we are doing here uh, with the tear gas uh, and with George Floyd protests is that we banded together as a group and wrote petitions from multiple schools. And I think that really was uh, impactful uh, for others. I think um, speaking, uh, doing it in groups also was something that we did or socializing uh, during the anti-Asian hate that happened, particularly in many uh, Asian predominant cities, uh, San Francisco, New York, and LA, where there was an increase of up all, you know, more than 300% in Asian hate crimes. Um, and I love this quote from John Yang from the Asian American Advanced Injustice. Especially during a time when groups are trying to divide and pit vulnerable communities against each other, we must remember that we are stronger together. So I think that um, you know, working together with groups uh, against Asian hate was something that I also ended up doing given my, my role in COVID. And UCSF's strategy with this was twofold. One is, um, you first of all, you educate the Asian community about the science so that if people had questions or they were giving misinformation or myths, uh, people can answer back in a very polite way. So we went to Chinese and Asian media, uh, radio, TV, uh, native language, English, uh, and, and talked about the biology of COVID. Uh, the second thing that we did was really encourage the community in general to be upstanders. So again, we're moving from a safe space, you know, having a safe space to having a brave space. And that's, that's kind of what I'll end with. So I think one, one person that I, I wanted to kind of give you a flavor of what happened is uh, reporter Betty Yu, who herself was a target of Asian hate when she did stories on highlighting what was happening in the community. And, um, and this is what she had to say. And I'm a reporter with KPIX5 CBS San Francisco. 
And I spent the better part of the pandemic covering COVID and all the developments related to the virus and also uh, the string of high profile attacks against Asian Americans in our community, particularly against the most vulnerable, the elderly. So we had COVID, which we had to be very careful about. And we also, as Asian Americans, had to watch our backs in our own communities. Uh, when I look back and I think about that time, what was most encouraging is being able to see our community galvanized in ways that I had never seen before. We supported one another, we spoke out, and this is something that we traditionally did not see a lot of Asians doing. So when I look back at that time and I think about all the activism that I witnessed, whether it was through speaking up, donating, marching in the streets, just sharing stories through social media, it gives me hope that when we band together, we can turn this kind of trauma and pain that we all experience as a community into strength and power. Well said by Betty. So that's really about coming together and socializing and not being able to do it on your own. The next S is disseminating and spreading the word. So I think after starting off with, you know, being talking about the biology and, and being credible and, and being trusted, I think, um, you know, I, I was able to be run on, on lots of things, you know, like um, radio and TV and newspapers and all of that. Uh, but when it comes to highlighting uh, what was happening in marginalized communities, that gave me a pulpit to talk about it. So maybe I'll talk about why COVID was, uh, COVID in the prison system was important to people in the community to know because there were people from the community who worked there and also our ICUs and our hospital beds were would could potentially be overcrowded by inmates uh, once they got COVID. So I think you know, highlighting some of what was going on in the prison system. And again, this was, uh, you know, I, w I, I saw Jody Rich yesterday who gave me uh, some of my first experiences in prison healthcare at Brown, Brown Medical School. And uh, again, I took all of these experiences and they came to play out uh, over the last three years. And even when I was, you know, I was staying in, in Warwick at that new Nilo Hotel, which is on the river. It was, it's quite beautiful actually in that uh, converted mill. Uh, we, Jody was taking me home last time, <laughs> passed by the maximum security prison and he was pointing it out to me and it just brought back a lot of uh, memories for me and I, I really used all of that, uh, you know, talking to the guards, interacting with uh, the uh, incarcerated individuals uh, to help me highlight the overcrowding that was going on in San Quentin and how it can impact the community and that's why we all needed to care. But the reason why I can talk about it is because, again, I was able to talk about biology for a while in medicine and then bring in that social agenda uh, when I wanted to. You know, in a lot of these interviews, they were live talkbacks. So it wasn't scripted like a reporter who kind of chopped up what you said. If you're on, a, on an air with, uh, on a live segment, you could kind of say what you wanted to. I mean, they could maybe there's a one second bleep or something, but you can kind of just slip in. And don't forget about, you know, what's happening in San Quentin. Um, I think during uh, monkeypox or mpox, uh, this idea of spreading the word was really, really important as well. Uh, there was a potential for a lot of misinformation and disinformation. We already had gone through COVID. Uh, we kind of knew what we had to do. Uh, but it was really, really slow, and I think uh, I was getting a lot of ner being very nervous because I was seeing a lot of patients coming in with painful ulcers. They were, it was, be they were being stigmatized. Um, you know, it was affecting instead of everyone, just uh, the uh, LGBTQ community. So I think this is what uh, we ended up doing. And I spoke to Reggie Aqui, who is one of the anchors for ABC station. Um, and what he did was a really remarkable thing, which is to bring uh, physicians and patients together on air to talk about the disease, to make it accessible. Because I think community members can only trust you if you're part of the community. So I think by bringing medicine and community together on a public platform like TV was really, really impactful. Question, which is how do you use uh, media for activism and, and how can clinicians and physicians get involved in that? Well, I think it's 
especially important that we have people on our air and online who are part of the communities that are affected. So, uh, you know, for COVID, we were all affected. You know, there wasn't anyone that COVID didn't touch. And so that was a little bit easier. But for something like MPOX, specifically in San Francisco, where we have such a large queer population, and where at the beginning, we weren't getting a lot of information about MPOX. And that's where the trouble really starts, because that's when there's misinformation, and that's when there are rumors being spread, and that's when panic can happen. So I really saw that as an opportunity to try and prevent the panic and try and get people the help they need as fast as possible. And to be quite honest, to play a role that sometimes our positions are allowed to play where we could push major entities involved, including health departments, including our hospitals, and including our politicians to do something in the absence of action. And what we were seeing from our point of view was not a lot of alarms going off when we thought that there was an urgency. So we play a part in that, but we also have to reach out to physicians in our community who know the players and are also a part of that community, which again, Dr. Peter Chin Hong stepping up after exhausting him with COVID and then immediately going into MPOX, having him and others like him, but especially him involved in a conversation that he is on the front lines of and also a part of that community, invaluable. And congrats on your GLAAD award, Reggie. So uh, your efforts can be uh, underestimated. Uh, we are all so proud. So thank well, you. Thank you. And you know, doing uh, we did a segment on our air with Dr. Peter Chin Hong and a man named Will in New York who had MPOX as we were speaking with him. And the bravery that Will Hutchinson showed us in that piece was really remarkable. So to have someone who knew what it was like in the moment to treat people with MPOX and knew someone else who knew what it was like to have it and to just let them have a conversation and have me moderate it occasionally was so powerful. And the fact that GLAD recognized it was truly an honor, an unexpected one, but one that I don't take lightly. And all credit goes to Dr. Peter Chen Hong and Will for participating. Thanks so much, Reggie. Of course, thank you. So, now that I told you why you should do it and some of the strategies you can, uh, or, or some of the themes in terms of being an activist, uh, I'll just spend like a few minutes on how to communicate effectively. So in medical school, we all learn how to talk to patients and it's really interesting because many of the techniques we use with patients are the same techniques we can use to talk to the community. And of course, they're very similar techniques we use in teaching as well, teaching medical students. Probably the most important one is really to be using plain language. I mean, it kind of seems like a no-brainer, but you'd be surprised how many scientists or clinicians go and use a lot of jargon uh, when they talk to the community, and it really alienates uh, the medical uh, professionals from the community. It creates a divide. Uh, it makes it seem more ivory tower-like. So I talked to Chris and Z uh, about how we can communicate better uh, in this setting. News anchor here at ABC7 News in San Francisco for about 22 years. I want to thank Dr. Chin Hong for inviting me to share a few thoughts with the medical community. Uh, COVID has certainly shown us that the information you convey and that we in turn disseminate to our viewers is so very, very important. It saves lives. So here are just a few simple tips that I uh, worked up for you. Um, we have a rule in journalism, KISS. It's an acronym meaning keep it simple, stupid. Um, and that just means in an interview, you wanna avoid jargon, avoid the really technical stuff that people can't understand anyway, and just try to keep it short and concise. Um, and also when it's short and concise, it's more of a conversation. It gives us the time to ask follow-ups. Um, and that also makes it easier to follow and feel less like a lecture. 
You certainly don't have to answer the question asked if the question misses the mark, because sometimes we don't know what we don't know. Um, so feel free to say, hey, um, I think the question really should be this, and then go ahead and answer that. Um, and you should feel free to use attention getters to kind of help us focus on what's really important. So do say, hey, this is the part that we have to pay attention to most, or these are the numbers that are most concerning, and this is why. Um, or the main point is this, and that really helps us clue in on it, like, oh, okay, this is what we need to focus on. Finally, humanize what you say, use examples. Hey, I know this girl who got COVID twice, and then this was the impact, it was harder the second time around. Um, use a little humor, um, analogies. So. I think these are all things you probably already do and know anyway. Um, know that you already come from a position of credibility and strength. We trust you, we believe you, and um, we want to understand you. So thank you again for all the great work that you have done. And thanks again, Dr. Chin Hong, for uh, inviting me to chat with you and have this opportunity. Take care. So the next S is uh, summons and subpoenas. So if you really want to have an impact, and at that point, um, you know, I was, again, thrust unexpectedly into the spotlight. Uh, I was already telling you that I was using biology as a core and then slipping in my social agenda, both to highlight disparities as well as to uh, initiate action. Um, but the, again, a really unexpected thing that I was asked to do is really uh, work with public defenders to try to do something about it on a, on a policy level. Um, and you know, one of the things that we did was, again, I, I mentioned that we, we talked about, uh, you know, banning tear gas in some places. Uh, and that was really not only from talking about why tear gas was bad for COVID transmission and acquisition, but actually working with lawyers to try to make that law. So one of the things I did with tear gas in particular was, was um, you know, um, do declarations and talk. It was kind of like writing a paper for, for, you know, you actually have to write, use a lot of references. I was surprised. I thought I would just like talk and they would just write and transcribe. It was actually much harder, but the rewards were, were much, um, you know, more profound on, on a larger level. Um, you know, one of the last things that I did um, was in terms of public um, policy was really work on when vaccines were now available uh, they uh, in back in 2020 in December they weren't available to everyone and there was an outbreak in these mental health hospitals state facilities in California and what we did was you know again I did a declaration and talked you know, worked with lawyers to try to have them release vaccines to everybody regardless of age in while there was an outbreak going on uh, we wanted them to sort of let people uh, go elsewhere but they weren't really you know they treated these state mental health facilities like prisons, uh, we already couldn't get them to uh, let people go who were really there for non-violent uh, crimes. Um, but that was another thing that I did. And then at the end of the day, I think you just have to have fun. Um, hard, work is hard enough. And one of the things that I was shocked is that people would recognize what was on the background and then would send me messages about it. And one of the craziest things was this, um, this Carmen Ryder V3 that one of my work colleagues, who's like my academic spouse, Brian Schwartz, uh, who I had taught with a lot, he had got me this from a garage sale and um, I had like just put it in the background and like all of a sudden all these people from all over the world were seeing it and like asking me if I was, a, if I knew where to get it and, and they were all like a big fan club and uh, I was just saying like I didn't know anything. And one of my other fun things I did during the pandemic was use this COVID plushie um, to really demonstrate uh, transmission, but particularly around spike proteins and how they mutate. Uh, and um, I remember talking to the BBC, really stiff BBC, and I, as a child, I was, you know, being a British old colony, you know, the BBC was everything and, and they were all so proper. And, um, and there I was sort of like being wild California now, waving around my COVID plushie. And I just show you a few seconds of how the BBC host um, reacted to that. It will still be very effective. It will take actually years if any meaningful strain difference will occur, if at all. 
That's an unnervingly acute model you have there. I have to ask you just brief. Anyway, so even the BBC can succumb to, um, to cheap thrills. Um, so the last thing I want to uh, leave you with in terms of uh, people's advice that I, I, I had uh, bringing advice is that at the end of the day, you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes, uh, not to get frustrated if people don't want to get vaccinated or don't want to take your public health interventions or you're going to go crazy. You have to continue to, to work on it as a conversation. Hey everyone, it's Raj over at NBC. First of all, thank you all for what you continue to do. I think there is some commonality here between um, how you're communicating with your patients and how I'm communicating with our viewers. Uh, these last seven months have been hectic, right? So much noise, so much information, so much misinformation. Uh, I think the best approach that's working for me is just to take all of it, boil it down, and just with a lot of compassion and clarity, uh, communicate with people. Um, I think one thing, especially for doctors, you guys are so smart, um, but really just break it down in layman's terms, use some anecdotes, I think those are always helpful, and make it appear that that patient or that family member, you have all the time in the world for them. I think compassion goes a long way, and just kind of dialing things down a bit uh, with your tone of voice, uh, eye to eye contact, and using names as much as possible. Anyway, just a few tidbits from me. Uh, I'm sure you guys don't need much help, but again, thanks for uh, what you're doing. And as we say in TV, we'll send it back to you. You see, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> so just to summarize, uh, you know, I, I give you part of my journey. I think Brown was a, a big part of, of that. Again, a program in liberal medical education is giving you those tools and those keys to open doors that you don't know about and you use them to open them. Uh, so using science as a core is really important. That's what separates, I think, people in science, in the sciences and health sciences, uh, because you can use that, you come from that position. But then uh, you speak up, you do it as a group, uh, you disseminate as much as you can, just like we do in publishing. Uh, you can translate it into policy, which can have the broadest impact, and then have fun doing it. And, you know, the six S's, there's probably a more important S as well, Ruth Sauber, um, uh, who I have all uh, the highest regard for. And thanks so much uh, for coming today. It means so much to all of us. Uh, and I wish Ruth were able to, to see this. Uh, I, I feel very honored to be given this uh, lectureship in honor of her. So the road ahead, I think, continues to be very uncertain. Uh, we will probably have another pandemic. It's uh, probably not as bad as COVID, but we've had seven designations of public health emergencies of international concern from the WHO since 2007. So there will be likely another one. I think, uh, you know, when that happens, I hope we can all, um, you know, be activists in our own way. And you don't have to be a loud activist, you can be a quiet activist. Um, I teach this workshop called Improving the Learning Climate for Clinicians uh, in the Community. And, and that is really when you want to create a, a good learning environment so learners from all diverse walks of life can thrive. And what we used to say is that you want to create a safe environment. Uh, but over the last three years, we've changed that to saying you, have to, you want to create a brave environment. Because you don't want everyone to just feel safe all the time. Uh, you want people to be brave. And sometimes being brave uh, means speaking out. So thanks a lot for your attention. And again, it was uh, an honor being here.